It's time for a battle of the titans. Today we're going to compare the Canon K35 thinner lenses versus Canon FD. Let's go. The Canon FD lineup offers some of the greatest vintage lenses. We are going to explore their cinema DNA in form of the Canon K35. They have been used in classic movies like Aliens and Barry Lyndon, shows like Westworld, Preacher and The Handmaid's Tale use the Canon K35's vintage characteristics for poetic storytelling. So, we join the Colonial Marines to answer the question. Are there lenses that give us the look of the Canon K35 in a somewhat affordable way? Choosing the right Canon FD lenses, we will build a dream set that will give us a comparable, if not indistinguishable look to the legendary Canon K35 lenses as their optics are virtually identical. To get there, we put together the ultimate guide to Canon FD from a filmmaker's perspective, with history and versions. Compare the similarities in image and design. Talk about coatings, aspherical elements, radioactive thorium and the effects on human and how to treat damage. Find out where to start and how to develop a set on a budget. We talk to an award-winning filmmaker that uses Canon FD and, of course, test the most important lenses ourselves, the practical shoot as well as a more technical test. We are going to show you how to de-click and to change the mount yourself, as well as sophisticated modding and calibration by SimMod. In our bias guide we discuss the value, where to buy them and how to spot counterfeit lenses. And along the way we will show you a little bit on how we did the alien effect shots using Film Convert Nitrate. Let that nerd inside you run wild. This is legendary cine lenses on a budget with a Canon FD. Listen up. Marines, welcome to the film school of the USS Sulaco. I'm your instructor, Lieutenant Nicholas, and I'm going to teach you what you can do with those helmet cameras of yours in battle and beyond. Let's start with some little history about Canon cine lenses. Know your gear, soldiers. In 1984, James Cameron directed the sequel to the vastly popular movie Alien, simply titled Aliens. Alien redefined how a science fiction horror movie should look. Ridley Scott created a dense atmosphere with lots of shadows and beaming lights. He used anamorphic lenses to capture claustrophobic spaces and vast stages, flowing into an epic cinematography. The camera movements are predominantly slow and the movie has an overall slow pacing. Aliens had a totally different approach. The grittier, more realistic look was a combination of the almost exclusive handheld camera, faster spherical lenses and 400 ISO film stock. It is considered one of the masterpieces that defined the action genre of its time and won an Oscar for visual effects. The lenses of choice for Aliens were the Canon K35. In the 70s, Canon decided to enter the cinema market with their own set of lenses. Unlike Panavision, Zeiss or Cook, Canon didn't have a long history designing cinema lenses. They couldn't fall back on existing designs in the same way. Developing a lens is extremely expensive and the low numbers to be sold in the saturated cine sector make the return of investment a challenge. What Canon did have 
were their cutting-edge designs for photography lenses, especially the super-speed lenses that used a spherical elements. The Canon FD spherical's with 24mm, 55mm and 85mm focal length. The optical designs of these lenses were paired with Cinestyle housings and complemented by super-fast 80mm and 35mm lenses that remained unique to the K35 Cine lenses. The Canon K35 launched in 1976 as the first super-speed Cine lenses that also incorporated spherical elements in all focal lengths. The Zeiss Superspeed, then known as the B-Speeds, were launched a year earlier but only used spherical elements in their wider focal lengths. The Canon FD have been designed for 35mm SLR systems, so their image cycle covers full frame and Vista Vision sensors, and so it's no surprise that the Canon K35 do that too, except for the 18mm that vignettes. This is quite unique among vintage cine lenses, as the vast majority of lenses were designed to cover Super 35 only. For comparison, the Zeiss Super Speeds cover full frame from 50mm upwards, but only barely with quite visible brightness fall off. As good as it sounds, in their time the K35 haven't been vastly popular and only very few Hollywood productions made use of them, even though they always had their fans, among them Stanley Kubrick. He utilized the extremely fast lenses in Barry Lyndon that worked with as much natural light as possible. While the candlelight scenes used the mysterious size planar f0.7, we have an episode about that subject linked in the corner, all other shots used the Canon K35 except for those famous zoom shots. As Barry Lyndon was shot in 1974 and the K35 were released in 1976, we assume that he used prototype lenses. Never say no to a living legend. In modern times, the K35 have been rediscovered for the extra creamy look and soft tradition of skin. Qualities that are highly thought after and rarely found in modern lenses. Like in 2013's Her. The K35 have been also used to give American Hustle its vintage look. They have been used on Manchester by the Sea to achieve an out of things feel. And they are also very popular with TV shows, like here in the gloriously disrespectful Preacher. Or in The Handmaid's Tale. Or like here in Westworld, where uncoded K35 have been used to give dreams and flashbacks of hosts a distinctive visual key. The image is softer, warmer and dreamier than modern lenses. There's something poetic and, if you allow this analogy, something almost female about how the lenses render the image. But of course, they can look gritty just as well, as Aliens shows. The K35 originally came with BNCR mounts, so all lenses that you can rent today are modified. This 5-piece set belongs to cinematographer Roy Cudloyan from the USA. He recently gave them a complete modernization with TLS rehousings. You can actually rent this Canon K35 set. Just drop him a message on Facebook. Also check him out on Instagram under the handle Vintage Cinegear. Links are in the description. With the industry moving to larger formats for digital cinecams like the Alexa LF, Sony Venice and Red Monstro, vintage lenses like the K35 that do cover these larger formats become more and more popular. Many say that the market is completely overheated. The K35 are ridiculously expensive, with some 5P sets costing more than $200,000 at the time. That means that, per lens, the K35 are some of the most expensive prime lenses that you can buy, vintage or modern. I only need to know one thing, where they are. It is more if you can find them, Vasquez. Even rentals are hard to get by due to the high demand. Bring us to the question, are there lenses that give us a look of the Canon K35 in a somewhat affordable way? Based on the Canon K35's history, the obvious answer is of course the Canon FD. Some of them. What exactly are we dealing with here? Are you skeptical, Reese? What's up, punk? Hudson, sir. 
He's Hicks. Sure, sorry, wrong movie. That's what you get when a director permanently uses the same actress. Our tech sergeant Ripley will give us now an overview how easy it is to change the mount of a Canon FD lens. Ripley? I'll tell you what I know. We tried to get it off, it wouldn't come off. Later it seemed to come off by itself and die. I think we're gonna need another opinion on that one. So, how close are the Canon FD to the K35? And with all the different FD lenses, which ones? Let's take a very general look at the Canon FD system. Canon FD is a system introduced in 1971, and there were two major lens generations with subdivisions. The first series is called the Chrome Nose, because they feature a chrome filter ring. They were the lenses to introduce the breech lock FD mount, that replaced the older FL mount. The second series replaced the chrome filtering with a black ring and engraved the coating SC in white or SSC in red on the front of the lens. The third series changed the green outer aperture O to a green A and the chrome aperturing lock button was changed from chrome to black. In 1978 Canon introduced the new FD series. Canon changed the design altogether, reduced the weight and switched to a bayonet mount that is still compatible with the older mount but doesn't have a locking mechanism. The new FD lenses are often called NFD or FDN, just go for what you like. The NFD area also saw the advent of the L series of lenses, L standing for luxury, and this brand is still in use for Canon's high-end lenses today. All FD variants are manual lenses. Electronic connections and servos for focus were introduced in 1987, abandoning the FD mount to the still popular EF mount. Spanning over 16 years, the FD system has been around for a long time and has been very popular. The high number of lenses in the market make them very available and comparably affordable. The low prices and the all-manual design make Canon FD one of the most popular vintage systems. An NFD 50mm f1.4 can be had for just $50. And this is what is so great about the FD system. It is a system that can grow with you. From building a cheap beginner set that still looks amazing, right up to lenses that look virtually identical to the K35. If you need to expand your set, you usually don't have to break the bank. There's always a relatively cheap lens to fill the position. And if you feel the need and you have the resources, you can upgrade that position to something really special later. As affordable as the Canon FD start, there are some real unicorns in the lineup. The 24mm f1.4 SSC Aspherical in mint condition will set you back around $4,500 at this time. The breech lock mount of the first generation has a locking ring on the lens instead of the camera. And I have to say, it's great for filmmakers. While the usual bayonet mounts can be applied quicker, the FD locking mechanism guarantees zero play. Perfect for using a follow focus or focus motor. Of course, if you adapt the lens, you will still have a little play between the adapter and your camera mount, but still, it's one less connection to worry about. And if your camera has a locking mount itself, like our Kinefinity E mount does, you have a rock solid connection. Canon FD lenses of the first generation have a very sturdy metal build, and the barrels in the optical block are made from heavy brass. With introduction of the NFD, Canon switched to lighter materials. NFD lenses have more plastic parts inside and outside, and the barrels of the optical block are made from much lighter aluminum. We prefer the feeling of the SSC over the lighter build of the NFD, but if weight is a critical factor, like for use in drones or gimbals, the NFD may be just right. The chrome noses have either spectra coating or super spectra coating, but neither coating is signified on the front of the lens. When coating became an important marketing tool for many manufacturers, Canon started to signify SC or SSC on all lenses with an engravement. While the SSC brand disappeared on the NFD, the same general coating remained in use. The marketing hype around coatings just leveled off a bit. So, most Canon FD lenses use SSC coatings, but that doesn't mean that they are all the same. A SSC branding does not entail that all use the exact same recipe you can see significant differences when light reflects from the surfaces. Some lenses look golden, some greenish, and some neutral. 
Indeed, the coating didn't only change slightly between versions of the lenses, but also from lens to lens and sometimes from one serial number range to another. That is something that is also the case with the K35. That means that sets that are assembled from different period lenses will most probably show subtle shifts in color reproduction. Even the lens designer from Canon would have a hard time to tell you the exact coating a lens has. This means you shouldn't hang yourself too much on the coating's branding. It is, more or less, a marketing vehicle. Starting with the FD system, Canon was the first manufacturer to offer a lens with an aspherical element for 35mm SLR. The surface of an aspherical lens is exactly what it says it is, not spherical. It is a more complex surface profile, reduces or eliminates spherical aberrations and astigmatism. It can also reduce the number of lens elements needed and therefore allow for lighter and brighter designs. The graphic shown here exaggerates the aspherical surface to show the concept. With the shift to SSC branded lenses, Canon had a small set of super fast aspherical lenses in their program. The 24mm f1.4 aspherical, the 55mm f1.2 aspherical and the 85mm f1.2 aspherical. As the aspherical elements had to be grinded by hand with painfully tiny tolerances of only 0.1 micron, that's 1 in a 10 thousandths of a millimeter, they are rare and therefore more expensive. But more importantly, they were the blueprints for the K35 lenses. The corresponding K35 focal lengths are optically virtually identical with these lenses. With the advent of the NFD lenses, Canon found a way to machine aspherical elements and all of the NFD L series have such an aspherical element. K35 are often repaired with the elements of the aspherical's. And these lenses are also used to fill up K35 sets with missing focal lengths. There are minimal differences in the use of thorium with the 24mm and the 85mm focal length. We will see that reflected in the upcoming radioactivity tests. While we can't make a direct comparison as no K35 are available for rent at this time, we have been assured by P&S Technic that offers professional rehousing for the K35 and FD that differences are neglectable. The K35 have one obvious different visual feature compared to the FD a rounder bokeh due to their higher count of iris blades. The iris of the FD lenses can be exchanged against a higher blade count iris with a rehousing. Rehousings are quite expensive though and will set you back 3 to 4 thousand euros depending on the lens. So if you want to turn your FDs into real cine lenses that work on PL cameras or to pimp your existing K35 sets, this is your first address. Thank you PNS Technic for your input. Released. Optically, the SSC aspherical seem to be virtually identical to the legendary K35. That means we can go on our mission now. We are going to build our K35 lookalike dream set using the SSC aspherical lenses and test it. Mark. to DCS ranging. 240, nominal to profile. We're in the pipe, five. Damn it. Damn, I dropped it. How many drops is this for you, Lieutenant? Really, Ripley? I mean, really? We're going to add a 35 mm F2 concave. Another highlight from the Canon FD lineup. We are also going to test more affordable FD lenses and pitch those against our dream set to see if the aspherical's are worth it and how close you can get on a budget. Here we are pitching a 55mm SSC f1.2 and a 24mm NFD f2 against their aspherical counterparts. While we are at it, we are also going to pitch a 50mm SSC f1.4 against a 50mm NFD 1.4 to see if we can spot any difference. 
If you have seen our affordable legendary cine lenses episode about the Zeiss Superspeed and their photo siblings the Contact Zeiss, I'll put a link in the corner, you know that we like to start with something that isn't a technical test, but an emotional piece. This is supposed to allow you to get a feeling for the lenses. Later we are going to make a more technical test. For the emotional part we are only going to use our K35 lookalike dream set. Now that you've gotten a feeling for the FD look, let's get into the very plain technical test that should show you things like flare, breathing, sharpness, color rendition and so on and of course give you a few specs along the way. The lights are set and the room is haste to give a bit of a cinematic look. We're going to start with the dream set and the 85mm aspherical. We will go wider from there and show cheaper Canon FD afterwards. The 85mm spherical is quite a beast that opens up to a super fast f1.2. Unmodded it weights a hefty 744 grams. At f1.2 the lens is soft with expressive bokeh. The breathing is tolerable. Focus throw is about 180 degrees. And here you see what the K35 and the Canon FD are famous for, the soft and pleasing rendition of skin. The 85mm is a very good portrait lens that is forgiving to skin of elderly people like me. The lens flares absolutely beautifully while not going over the top, just like you want in a narrative. Close focus is good for 85mm with 1 meter. Closing the lens down to f2.8 sharpens the image considerably. And the difference with the overall look is massive. The image tells a completely different story, details pop and the look is much more modern. Flares are still interesting enough. As always, this is a prop gun, absolutely legal and harmless. Closing to f4 sharpens a bit more and adds depth of feel. This is the same shot how the framing looks on Super 35. And this is the framing on micro four thirds. 
For Limbo we use the 85mm wide open for dreamy shallow depth of field and flares. The 85mm f1.2 aspherical is very rare and if you can find one they cost around $1500 at this time. A good alternative is the 85mm NFDL f1.2 that goes for around $700. A budget alternative would be 85mm SSC f1.8 for around $250. You will find eBay links in the description. The next lens is the 55mm Aspherical that also has the super fast f1.2 aperture. Unmodded, it weighs 561 grams. At f1.2, the lens is soft with expressive bokeh, but not as soft as the 85mm. The breathing is tolerable, the focus throw is about 190 degrees. Even wide open, it is considerably sharper compared to the 85mm while maintaining a nice vintage look. The lens flares look beautiful and harmonic. Close focus of the 55mm is good with 60mm. Closing the lens down to f2.8 sharpens up the image. Again, the image tells a different story, but not as pronounced as with the 85mm. Closing to f4 sharpens a bit more and adds depth of field. This is the same shot how the framing looks on Super 35. And this is the framing on Micro Four Thirds. For Limbo we use the 55mm for the wider shots. On full frame it is still a focal length that one can shoot handheld without volume, making it the ideal companion for filming street life in low light. The 55mm f1.2 aspherical is rare and costs around $800 if you can find one. A good alternative is the 50mm NFDL f1.2 that goes for around $800. A budget alternative would be the 55mm SSC f1.2 for around $200. We will test in a minute how close that one gets. You will find eBay links in the description. The next lens is the 35mm Concave, the only lens in our dream set that is not an aspherical and only opens to f2. Like the name entails, the front element is not convex but concave. All 35mm under the serial number of 100,000 have that concave front element. The concave are said to be vastly superior to the later 35mm version with a convex front element. We include it into the set to close the wide gap between the 55mm and the 24mm aspherical and because the 35mm allows for very close focus, bringing it into the macro range. We used it in Limbo for the ultra close-ups. Unmodded, it weighs 376 grams. At f2, the lens is already reasonably sharp. The breathing is tolerable. The focus throw is about 180 degrees. Of course, the 35mm is naturally missing a bit of the vintage magic that the faster lenses offer, but it still works great as a bridge that fits with general rendition and flaring. The real benefit is the close focus of 30mm that allows you to show important details in your narrative. Or very dramatic perspectives. Or lets you have your Blair Witch moment. Closing the lens down to f2.8 sharpens up the image a little.
Because of the small jump, the image remains very consistent. Closing to f4 sharpens a bit more. This is the same shot how the framing looks on Super 35, and this is the framing on Micro Four Thirds. The 35mm f2 concave is quite available and costs around $200 at this time. Be sure to look after serial numbers below 100,000 to get the concave version. A lighter alternative would be the 35mm NFD f2 for around $200, but we prefer the concave for sure. You will find eBay links in the description. The last lens from the Dream Set is the 24mm f1.4 aspherical, and that is a real unicorn. It is ultra rare and expensive as hell, so you might want to look into the alternatives we will show. Unmodded, it weighs 503 grams. At f1.4, the lens is already reasonably sharp. The breathing is minimal. Focus throw is about 170 degrees. You can see that on full frame there is some visible vignetting. This might be the fold of the matte box. On full frame, 24mm is already very wide and about the widest you would go without having an effect shot look. Wide lenses tend to be good at close focus, and the 24 spherical has a 30cm minimum focus distance. Not great, but it allows you to show off details in a larger context. Closing the lens down to f2.8 sharpens up the image, but not by much. Closing to f4 sharpens a bit more and adds depth of field. This is the same shot how the framing looks on Super 35. And this is the framing on Micro Four Thirds. For Limbo we use the 24mm for handheld pans as very wide lenses look smoother in motion. And of course for ultra wide shots that didn't really make it to the final edit. Like we said, the 24mm f1.4 aspherical is ultra rare and a mint lens can cost $4,500 if you can find one. Even the logical alternative, the 24mm NFD L f1.4 is stupid expensive at around $3,000. A budget alternative would be the 24mm NFD f2 for around $200. We will test in a minute how close that one gets. You will find eBay links in the description. We will now go through some great budget options that still offer a very nice vintage and cinematic look. And while we do that, we will put them right next to the lenses of the Dream Set. We will also compare the 50mm SSC and NFD to see if there is a difference. We will start with the elephant in the room the 55mm SSC f1.2 that looks almost identical to the aspherical version and has the same super fast aperture of f1.2, which is why it's used to counterfeit the much rarer and pricier 55mm aspherical. We will tell you how to spot a counterfeit lens in our buyer's guide. Unmodded, it weighs 522 grams, that's a bit lighter than the aspherical. At f1.2, the lens is soft with expressive bokeh, the breathing is tolerable, the focus throw is about 180 degrees. At the first glance, it looks very much identical to the aspherical version, even wide open. The lens flares look beautiful and harmonic. Close focus of the 55mm is good with 60cm. Closing the lens down to f2.8 sharpens up the image.
closing to f4 sharms a bit more. This is the same shot, how the framing looks on Super 35, and this is the framing on Micro Four Thirds. If we put the shots of the 55mm spherical and the 55mm SSC side by side, we can tell that they look very much alike. Overall sharpness and general look are close to be indistinguishable. That is wide open and stopped down. Where the aspherical shows a visible advantage is in aberrations in the corner of the image. This might be desirable in FX, product and architecture videography, but much less in an narrative context. For those cases, you would not go for a vintage lens to begin with. For somebody that wants vintage character in their image, this is absolutely neglectable. For filmmakers on a budget that look for a super fast vintage lens, the Canon FD 55mm SSC is a must have. It has good availability and costs around $200. You will find eBay links in the description. If that is still a bit much, or you're looking for a lighter lens, there is the SSC 50mm f1.4 and the NFD 50mm f1.4. How close can you get with those? Let's find out. Let's start with the SSC version of the 50mm f1.4. Unmodded, it weighs 312 grams. At f1.4, the lens is pretty sharp. The breathing is tolerable. Focus throw is about 200 degrees. The lens flares look beautiful, just like the look on the more expensive siblings. Close focus of the 50mm is good with 45cm. Closing the lens down to f2.8 sharpens up the image. Closing to f4 sharpens a bit more. This is the same shot how the framing looks on Super 35 and this is the framing on Micro Four Thirds. The 50mm SSC f1.4 has good availability and costs around $80. The NFD version of the 50mm f1.4 is next. As the NFD have the same or very similar SSC coatings and the design is the same, we can expect very similar results compared to the SSC version. Unmodded, it's a bit lighter at only 244 grams. At f1.4, the lens is pretty sharp, the breathing is tolerable, focus throw is about 200 degrees. The lens flares look beautiful, just like the SSC version. Close focus of the 50mm is good with 45cm. Closing the lens down to f2.8 sharpens up the image. Closing to f4 sharpens a bit more. The 50mm NFD f1.4 has very good availability and costs around $50. Next to each other, we would say they look more or less the same. There seems to be a tiny difference in the color temperature but nothing that you can fix easily in the grade. Differences might be due to the density of the haze. And how does that look in relation to the slightly faster 55mm f1.2 that costs about four times as much? From the feel, they're pretty much the same. So if you want to be cheaper and you don't need the little extra bokeh and brightness, 
the 50mm lenses are very good bang for the buck. You will find eBay links to all of them in the description. Our last entry is the 24mm NFD F2. With the extremely high prices of the f1.4 24mm spherical and the 24mm NFDL, this lens is your fastest and cheapest option in the Canon FD lineup. Unmodded, it's a bit lighter at only 286 grams. At f2, the lens is pretty soft. The breathing is tolerable. Focus throw is about 180 degrees. Close focus is the same at 30 cm. Closing the lens down to f2.8 sharpens up the image. Closing to f4 sharpens a bit more. This is the same shot how the framing looks in Super 35 and this is the framing on Micro Four Thirds. If we compare the 24mm f2 against the Unicorn, the 24mm f1.4 as spherical, we see quite a difference. The f2 is a bit softer and the highlights are blooming a bit more, even though it is significantly slower. If we zoom to 200%, that becomes very obvious. So, like it was to be expected, the 24 NFD f2 can't compete with the 24mm spherical, but due to the price, this might very well be a bitter pill that you will need to swallow. The 24mm NFD f2 is quite rare and costs around $400. If that is still too much, there's a 24mm f2.8 that can be had starting around $250. You will find eBay links in the description. In the end of the episode, we have a little buyer's guide. There we will discuss which lens you should get and why, where to get them and the development of value. I hope this test will help you to build your opinion on the Canon FD lenses. But besides that, let's see how an award-winning cinematographer that actually uses Canon FD feels about them. Check those corners. What is that? Hey, Benjamin Dowie here, Australian cinematographer and director, um, based here and working around the world. I've been in the industry about 14 years, um, with a few wins along the way. Um, picked up a few Australian Cinematographer Society awards, uh, which is always very nice, and it's just an uh, amazing industry to be in and always learning. And uh, I hope to continue to, um, to do what I'm doing for a long time yet. Yeah. I think ever since early days of you know dabbling with film and trying new things and experimenting, I've always kind of gravitated towards the um, more analog kind of natural uh, look, and that has stuck with me um, over the years. Even though my style has evolved a lot since early days, I still that resonates with me. That aesthetic, that's uh, that kind of very. Um, analog, vintage filmy, nice look, I, I just love it, you know, how can you not? I built a really nice vintage anamorphic setup quite a few years ago, which I love a lot, but it's, it's a very um, kind of unique uh, vintage look, has a lot of kind of vintage character, uh, and it's not suited for a lot of client work, so I was just using it for personal projects. And I think that's when I started to go down the route of looking for some really nice vintage sphericals that I could use um, on client work, you know, that weren't so vintage and, and didn't have such a distinct look, but still had uh, something that kind of lent itself to my aesthetic. I was doing a lot of research, looking into different options and uh, watching loads of videos and reviews and, um, and finally settled on the, the Canon FDs. Uh, because they have a beautiful look. The, the price range is about right what I was looking to spend and um, uh, they're very compact, uh, great for you know when I'm, when I'm traveling and wanting to you know, travel light. 
um, and then you know they they work seamlessly on a proper bigger production environment as well. The more I shoot with these FDs, the more I'm growing to love them. Um, the the way they render skin tones and the fall off and the highlights slightly blooming and the kind of beautiful, soft, creamy, um, delicious look that they give you. Uh, it's, yeah, it really lends itself to the kind of feel that I'm trying to achieve and the aesthetic that I go for in my work. Um, uh, look forward to shooting with them for many, many years to come. Thanks a lot for your insights, Benjamin. You'll find a link to his Vimeo account in the description. Hey! While Ripper and Newt play with my pet, I can take you behind the scenes of the alien spoofs in this episode. Sorry kids, but this is really the best way to get rid of your arachnophobia. Trust me on this one. Actually, it isn't that hard to do. With some props, lights and a bit of passion, you're right there. You don't even need a studio. I shot all scenes in my small living room. The post is super simple and fun, using Film Convert Nitrate. Let's start by getting the right props. We've got a jumpsuit, a cap and insignias that the Colonial Marines wear on eBay. We also got a vintage military headset. Nothing is similar to the real alien props, but it's close enough. And here comes the passion we are talking about. Lieutenant Goreman has a shaved head, so off with the hair for a little bit of movie authenticity. We set up a couple of lights to resemble the direction and quality of light in the original footage. A pop-up backdrop will prevent folds that make keying difficult. We use a blue screen because the jumpsuit is green. As we don't move around, we can light the screen with one lamp right behind us. We apply some artificial sweat and shoot the required takes. Different scenes require changes in the light setup and wardrobe. We do the post in Adobe Premiere and After Effects. We edited a storyline with existing footage to see what backdrops and what lengths will be required. We now just throw our blue screen footage roughly cut on top. When we get a timing match, we export backdrops and blue screen shots to After Effects. Here we do all the movie magic to make the footage match. Our simple and fun way to simulate film stock is Film Convert that we have been using for years. The new Film Convert Nitrate is the next step in Film Convert's evolution. If you don't know Film Convert Nitrate, it's an easy to use plugin for After Effects, Primaire, Final Cut and Resolve to emulate the film look. Simply install Nitrate into your suite and download the camera pack matching the camera you're shooting with. This will allow to emulate a variety of film stocks from Kodak to Fuji optimized for your camera, either in log or in the specific profile you shot with. This can also be used to match different cameras you used on set. Besides this one-step solution, Film Convert has quite a powerful color correction tool built right in. Really unique is the Film Grain tool. Here you can not only dial in the film format, but also choose what size, softness and strength the grain should have. You can even use a curve editor to give shadows, midtones and highlights just the right dose of grain to exactly match the grain of the movie scene. We showed the guys from Film Convert some of the alien scenes and they were nice enough to sponsor this episode. This means that we got help to make this episode bigger and better than we would have without them. And it means you can get Film Convert Nitrate 10% off using the code Media Division during checkout. You can own Film Convert Nitrate for $125 instead of $179. That is a real bargain for a plugin that we use almost every day and that has a constant stream of updates and profiles for new camera releases. Thank you, Film Convert, for your support. As always, links to all props, gear, software, and music are in the description. The perfect tool to make scenes like this one work. Give it a break, Ripley. She doesn't bite hard. Before we continue with modding, please give us a like if you think we deserve one. Subscribe to see more of Wicked Filmmaker fun. Leave us your comment below. And if you want to become a member, the join button is right there.
The Scott is our supporter tier. You will get our honest gratitude and access to a deep dive tutorial on how to execute some of the alien spoofs from this episode and the shining spoof from a former episode. If you ever had the feeling that all this shouldn't be free, this is where you can show us some love for only 99 cents a month. The Lynch is our team tier. You will get access to some exclusive member content with each new episode. Besides the deep dive tutorial, you will also get some After Effects files and a Film Convert Nitrate test version. Here you will have the right nitrate settings and some of our blue screen footage to play with. The Lynch tier costs only $3.99 per month. The Kubrick is our pro tier. Kubrick members get everything the lower tiers get and they will get consulting. Need some help with your production, your YouTube channel, or do you want to have a direct line to us in general? A Kubrick membership will give you all that for only $9.99 per month. All active members are credited in the end title of each episode. Our Kubrick members will also get a personal shout out during the end credits. Thank you very much for your support. You make it possible. The copyrighted movie footage is under fair use and not included in any of our member files. We love the filmmakers behind it and respect the copyright holder. We hope that these playful homages will keep the legacy of these great movies alive and make them relevant for the next generation. Why don't enjoy Aliens in its full beauty one more time? Head over to your favorite store or streaming services after this episode and show them some love too. Links are in the description. If you want to know what we are cooking and get some IGTV for the road, please join us on Instagram under our handle media.division. Here you can also get some exclusive behind the scenes and insights in our setups in VFX. For this episode, you will find the lighting setup of the lens test over there. If you are more into the in-depth discussion with us and a growing community of passionate filmmakers, join our close Facebook group. Here you can drop any questions about this episode or any other of our epic episodes. Links are in the description. If you haven't done so already, why don't you watch our epic episode about shooting with f0.7 lenses after you finished this one. One of the major holdbacks is that the FD mount is not compatible with the popular EF mount. Unlike other vintage lenses from the same time, like the Contax Yashica or Leica R, the flange of the FD systems are longer, but a little shorter than EF. That means that there is no easy way to adapt the lenses to EF, or PL for that matter, and still be able to reach infinitive focus. You can use an additional optical element, a diopter inside an adapter. Many cheap products are available on eBay. These adapters cause a considerable degradation of the image quality, especially when shot wide open, so don't do that. Canon did this presumably on purpose, so FD users had to buy an all new lenses for their EF system. All systems that use a shorter flange system, basically all mirrorless systems like Nikon Z, Sony E, Canon RF, L mount, X mount, Micro Four Third, all these only need a simple mechanical adapter. Adapters with diopter elements may be tempting to get the FDs onto otherwise incompatible cameras like the EVO 1 but all our test results have been awful, so we don't recommend them. Plain mechanical adapters do the job just fine when Canon FD is used on shorter flange systems. As you can see, it has an integrated wheel that you have to turn from open to lock after installing the lens, otherwise your iris will always stay at maximum aperture. This is just part of the FD system. Adapters will work on all mount variations. For smaller formats like Super 35 and Micro Four Third, there are native Canon FD focal reducers on the market. This is an older Metabone speed booster for Micro Four Thirds with a 0.7x factor, so it will gain one stop and give you a 0.7 times wider field of view on Micro Four Third cameras. As all Canon FD lenses are full frame, that will still mean that you can't use the whole image projection. As of now, there is no XL version of the Canon FD focal reducer on the market. We put links to buy adapters and focal reducers for all systems in the description. Of course this will leave a few popular camera systems in the cold. The Alexa, the Panasonic EVA 1, the Blackmagic Pocket 6K, 
The Canon C cameras. For Ursa and Red DMC2, there are third-party mounts on the market. An EF mount on the Canon FD will make the lenses so much more versatile. And a lot of the gear that you might already have can be used with these lenses. Like maybe a speed booster for EF. While it is considerably easier to exchange the mount on longer frame systems like Leica R, it is still possible to do so on the Canon FD. It's just a little sportier. This will bring us to our next big segment, modding Canon FD. Hello, Ripley. Are you with us to mod a set of Canon FD lenses? This will mean to make them more practical and versatile for filmmakers. We're going to add gears to focus and iris, unify the thread size, declick the aperturing and look into possibilities to change the mount to EF. You're going out there to destroy them, right? Not to study, not to bring back. Of course not. We want to give vintage lenses a second life and we strongly believe that the real value of any lens lies only in its usability. But we would like to make you aware that some of the Canon FD lenses are considered collectibles. Especially the SSC spherical's are popular with collectors. A modded lens will not be considered mint and unmodding might be complex. For collectors, modding a lens will reduce its value. On the other hand, if your buyer is a filmmaker, the added value of a modding could pay off. All right, I'm in. Let's do it then. I think the we are great fans of the do-it-yourself approach and we are going to show you how to declick, dampen, gear and exchange the mount of a Canon FD. But if you are going to invest in something like the SSC Aspherical's or NFDL, it makes a lot of sense to let professionals do the job. They have other services on the menu as well and those need serious experience to pull off. We collaborated with Simod in the United States to show you the benefits and the beauty of professional modding of the Canon FD. This is our dream set after it came back from modding. We got focus gears and the front ring sizes are unified to 80mm. A common size for smaller cine lenses and really practical if you want to attach a matte box. Of course, the lenses are declicked and dampened for smooth aperture operation. The most important part of the modding is probably the mount exchange to EF. Simod is the only service that has mount exchanges for the aspherical's on the menu. The extreme high speed of the aspherical require a short flange and that means that the optical elements of the original mount are already inside the mount. And this is why the mount exchange on these lenses is especially difficult. Irreplaceable parts can easily be damaged. And that is why it should be handled by a professional service like Simit to begin with. A beautiful lens deserves a beautiful finish. All lenses got machined aluminum caps with a tailor-made design. If you like this design, all our higher tier members will find files of these in their episodes action pack. And if you need them for other focal length or with your company's logo, hit us up by mail or on our close Facebook group. But Simit can do more than meets the eye. The lenses have been re-greased. After decades of use, some lenses can get a little rough to focus, and that can be a problem. The re-greasing can make operation smooth again. A fair warning, not all lenses can be made smooth again. If the barrel is warped, no grease will help. Never send a wreck to modding. It's not a repair, it's a refinement that should be only applied to the best lenses you can find. I especially want to mention the calibration service. The infinity markings on the focus ring usually never really hit infinity, making the hot stop of a manual lens only half as good. Simod can recalibrate the alignment of the focus barrel, so your infinity hard stop is actually spot on infinity. A full service by Simod like the ones we got, including mounts, gears, caps, calibration, the whole shebang will cost you around $200 per lens, depending on the lens. But as Simod is just as nice as they are professional, you can use the code Media Division during checkout and that will drive the price a bit down. You can find the link to Simod and the sales code in the description. Thank you Simod for your support and for giving our dream set a whole no professional face. We totally understand that if you only spend $50 on a lens, 
you will probably hesitate to spend $200 on a professional modding service. Unfortunately, there are only very few do-it-yourself kits around. One go-to address was at Mika in the past. Simot will sell these kits in the future, but only to lens service professionals and expert users under restrictions. One option is the quite costly kits from FD to EF. They charge $151 for SSC kits and $131 for new FD kits. And they have no options for the aspherical's. They do come chipped for data, but that is hardly worth the premium. If you add the cost for focus gears and front rings, not to mention your time, a full SIMUT service has to be the recommended option. There's also a 3D printed version available in Shapeways, but we are not convinced that this is a good idea. For those of you that might be in a country where you can't just send your lenses to the USA, we will show very briefly the do-it-yourself exchange of the mount, the clicking and addition of focus gears to a Canon FD SSC 55mm f1.2 using an FD to EF mount kit and gears by followfocusgears.com. You will need the usual gear, screwdrivers, preferably magnetic, some tweezers, a light helicot grease and a strong niogel for the iris ring and cleaning products. As always, everything you do to your lens is on your own risk and lens modding is risky. Don't come here and cry if something went wrong. First, we will have to remove the mount. There are two small screws on the side of the chrome part. Only remove those if you are sure you want to exchange the mount permanently. If you just want to declick the lens, turn the chrome element to reveal three screws underneath. Remove those screws. Now you can lift the whole mount off in one piece. If you choose to remove the tiny screws on the side, a nose will fall off that is quite hard to put back in. If you do want to exchange the mount permanently, removing the tiny screws will allow you to screw the chrome part off the mount and give easier access to the larger screws underneath. Remove the three large screws. Now we can lift off the lower part of the mount. These two screws hold a metal plate that keeps the focus ring in place. Remove screws and plate. Now you can remove the iris ring. There are two little metal balls and tiny springs in these two holes. Remove the balls and springs with your tweezers. For dampening, we show you a little trick that allows you to give the iris ring exactly the resistance you want. First, put some light grease on the lower plateau of the iris ring. Now take the niogel and put a couple of small dots around the same platform. Spread that out evenly. Put the ring back on and see if the resistance suits you. If it's too light, put some more dots of niogel around and repeat until you got it right. If it's too much resistance, clean the ring and start over. Remove any excess grease. Put the metal plate back in place and screw it in. Now it is time to put on the EF mount. This is an FD to EF kit and besides the bayonet itself, it comes with a shorter screws and a small plastic part. We start by removing this little metal part held by two screws. As you can see, this little fork is moving the iris and it will have to be attached to the part that had the metal piece attached. We attach the plastic part that came with the mount. It is important that the ring is only attached to the nearer of the fork's pins. Use the two screw holes to screw in the plastic part. Iris ring and iris are now permanently attached to each other and fully manual. Place the EF bayonet on the lens and attaches with the screws that came with the mount. You can attach 3D printed seamless gears like the ones that followfocusgears.com offers. Just slip them over the focus ring. The poor man uses a simple step up ring to unify the front sizes. We like 77mm as this will cover all front sizes and you will still find cheap photo equipment to fit those. Done is the do it yourself Cinemod. The 55mm SSC F1.2 now fits in the F mount. 
allows to use a focus motor and has a de-clicked and smooth iOS ring. Do it yourself or professional modding. The gears of the modded lens will allow us to use a follow focus or focus motor. The focus barrel extends during focusing and even though there's just a little, it brings some problems. The gears have to be wide enough and the motor has to be set carefully so the gears don't just spin off. Simmered gears are reasonably wide and set in the exact same position so you don't have to reposition your follow focus or motor after each lens change. The real problem is when you want to attach a matte box. You basically have two options. You can use a larger matte box with a flexible lens attachment, like the RE MMB2 offers one, but it will take ages to swap lenses. For compact lenses like the Canon FD, it makes sense to use an ultralight matte box that clamps directly to the lens front, and therefore extends with the lens. As professionals, we like to use our wide cine filters. There are only few options for that. Thank God, Tilda released the mini matte box. It's a very well thought through product and only costs $99. It comes with mounting options for different lens sizes, a 50mm rod holder and a carbon top flag. Without a filter it weighs only 130 gram. With a small donut it works on the 80mm front rings. Just perfect for a modded dream set. With the adapter rings you can easily clamp it on lenses without modding. We love the little details that Tilter put in to make life easier. The top flag has a practical locking mechanism. A feature we miss on much more expensive matte boxes. You can slide a 4x4 or a 4x5.65 filter inside the mount and a safety pin will hold it in place even if you choose to use it on a roller coaster. While the filter is inside, the top flag with the locking mechanism doubles as a protection. With the matte box attached and our favorite ProMist filter inside, you barely feel the extra weight. And that means that it doesn't put significant stress on the focus barrel of the lens. Focusing with a focus motor still works. We use the Tilter Nucleus N here that is also a very affordable and simple solution that we can recommend for vintage lenses, as the remapping will allow to set an extra long focus throw when you need it. There is always a grain of salt. From the lenses of our dream set, the 24mm has a rotating front element. That means that an attached matte box will rotate while focusing. Besides the weird look, the wide field of view of the 24mm will show vignetting with a rotating matte box making the solution unusable for the most part. If you don't have a camera that has built an ND or a short flange to fit an ND filter behind the lens, Simmert offers a nice very ND that fits the 80mm front rings perfectly. Still, the Tilda Mini Matte Box is an ideal companion for the FD and for all vintage lenses, as long as you only require one stage. But two stages with filters might put too much stress on the focus barrel. Well done, Tilter. Thank you for letting us review the mini mat box. And if you want to grab one, there's a link in the description. If we talk about Canon FD, we will have to talk about radiation. Some lenses we are talking about are radioactive due to the inclusion of thorium dioxide. Let's talk about why they use thorium, what that means, how to deal with the side effects, and of course, if they're a hazard to your health. Like many other brands, Canon used thorium to spike lens elements. Thorium is an abundant, naturally occurring, radioactive metal. If mixed into glass, it changes the index of refraction of glass while maintaining size and thickness, as well as low dispersion. This allows for a low aberration and distortion with simpler, lighter and cheaper designs. The amount of thorium inside the glass is much higher than one would anticipate, considering that thorium is a metal and opaque. It can contain up to 30% by weight in thorium. Thorium was later replaced with other materials after international treaties banned it from the mid-70s due to, you guessed it, health concerns. From the lenses we present to you in this episode, two use thoriated glass, and they are both lenses of our dream set. The 55mm spherical and the 35mm with a concave front element are both radioactive. Also radioactive are the following lenses from the FLFD lineup. From the K35 lineup, the following lenses are reported to be radioactive. As you can see, all new FD, including the L series, have abandoned thorium and are therefore not radioactive. 
Using a Geiger counter we can measure counts per minute or short CPM to evaluate the strength and origin of the radiation. The 35mm F2 SSC concave reads 524 CPM on the front and 1422 CPM on the rear element. This is considered moderate radiation. The 55mm F1.2 SSC spherical on the other hand is a real bad boy. It is the lens with the third strongest radiation among vintage lenses. From the rear it reads 6226 CPM and from the front a whooping 33,251 CPM. That is 23 times worth the radiation of the 35mm. Can we put this in perspective to understand the probable effects on your health? We all know that high doses of radiation can cause serious health problems, including a heightened risk for developing cancer later in life. The amount of time while radiation is absorbed is crucial. We use Röntgen Equivalent Man, or short REM, to evaluate the effects of radiation on the human body. One REM carries with it a 0.05% chance of eventually developing cancer. Doses greater than 100 RAM received over a short time period are likely to cause acute radiation syndrome and death. So how much RAM does a 55mm F1.2 SSC spherical and presumably a K35 55mm leave in your body? If you would hold the lens front directly to your head and you would leave it there for one hour, you would receive a dose something like 10 mg. That dose is equal to what the body absorbs during a dental x-ray or transatlantic flight in only one hour. Thorium-232 is an alpha emitter. Alpha radiation can be easily shielded even with a lens cap or human skin. Alpha emitters are more problematic when ingested. Unfortunately, the decay chain includes progeny isotopes that are beta and gamma emitters. While this sounds dramatic, a Swedish study from 2013 using a way less radioactive Zeiss Tessa came to the conclusion that with a typical usage for an average professional photographer, this adds up to a mere 0.2% of the maximum annual radiation dose to the eye, allowed by the conservative Swedish Radiation Protection Authority. That would mean that even with a bad boy Canon 55mm, he would easily remain in safe waters. Also, I had a chance to talk with my radiologist about the subject. Gamma radiation decreases just like visible light with the inverse square law. So intensity decreases to a quarter if we double the distance. With a distance of 2 meters, radiation from the lens will likely drop below the natural background radiation. To make it short, don't sleep on your lens and don't store it in close proximity to humans or animals. If you break the lens, don't inhale or ingest particles. Don't throw it in the trash. With this in mind, you're good to go. A little disclaimer. Keep in mind that we are neither experts on radiation nor on the related medicine. We are aware that CPM is not easily converted to REM and that there are better, more complex and conclusive methods to determine radiation effects. For here now, this shall do. After we are clear on health, does the radiation harm your camera sensor? Radiation has been reported to damage sensors over time when used in nuclear power plants and in space probes. In both scenarios, the radiation is higher by multitudes. We have no report of thoriated glass causing damage to a modern CMOS sensor, but we suggest not to leave radioactive lenses on your cam during long-term storage. For lenses, the isotope thorium-232 was used. It has a half-life of about 14 billion years, so don't hope for the lenses to be less hazardous anytime soon. But that also means that you don't have to worry about radioactive decay influencing the integrity of the element. Unfortunately, the radiation causes crystallographic defects. That means over time the glass of the element develops an amber tint. Besides the obvious shift in color reproduction, this will also reduce the light transmission, so your lens is not as bright as it could be. Some consider this tint a vintage characteristic, but as it is not intended by the designer, we like to compare it to rust on a classic car hardly desirable. Luckily there is a cure. And what might be the miracle cure for radiation damage? You guessed it. IKEA. Well, it is UV light that shines directly into the lens. It is important to use cold light sources as hot light might change the viscosity of the grease in the lens. And that means that the grease will run in places 
where you don't want it. LEDs with a high UV output are the ideal sources. IKEA produces the Yansyo LED lamp that is rumored to have a decent enough UV output while being cheap and practical. Let's test that. Our 35mm concave had very little but still noticeable yellow cast. As we know from the measurements, the rare elements are causing the tint, so we place the lens head down on a tiny hand mirror. This will bounce the UV light around the lens to enhance the effectiveness. Now we place the head of Yansir above the rare element and leave it there for a long, long time. Of course, you don't have to rotate the lens, it just looks cooler on film. After 48 hours, we were able to see a little improvement. For good measure, we treat the lens for a whole week and the result is a lens that has no meaningful tint. This seems to prove the rumored effectiveness of Yansir, though it works at glacier speed. Our last part is our buyer's guide. Here we talk about value, price development and which lens is suitable for which user. We also consider the best way to acquire lenses and how to spot counterfeit lenses. One of the key benefits of the lens range is that you can find a lot of very affordable starting points to build a set. You could just go out and buy a $50 NFD 50mm f1.4 to see if you like the look. In the slower range, you can add cheap options for longer and shorter focal lengths. In terms of format, the Canon FD lineup is, like most vintage systems, weaker and costlier in the wider end. We recommend using a focal reducer when possible. On Micro Four Thirds, there is no native FDXL speed booster. Be aware that the 85mm f1.2 does not fit the EF speed booster ultra as the lens elements touch each other. While it's always nice to have a dream set with the aspherical's or the L's or something comparable, I hope we have shown you that you don't need those to create an appealing image. And you can create images with these that are just as beautiful as the expensive ones. If an expensive set is your heart's desire and you have the resources, by all means, go for it. These lenses are truly timeless. And as thorium is and will stay a thing of the past, these lenses will remain unique and their supply limited. If prices will go up or down is as hard to predict as the stock market and depends a lot on the future of the independent filmmakers in an ever-changing marketplace. The prices are quite high for the unicorn lenses already, but some lenses just keep going up. We say they are safer investments if you want that. If you want to just gamble, gamble. If you fell in love with an image, a lens has its own reward. Buy accordingly. In any case, links to all lenses from this episode and beyond, and to all the gear and services that you could possibly need, are in the description. There's nothing better than to look at the state of the lens yourself and to negotiate the price in person. If you're good at that, the ideal way to set you up for that is to visit a fair, but who has time for that? Besides that, the obvious and best source for vintage lenses is eBay. eBay also gives you some safety against fraud. If you buy on eBay, always look for offerings that are inside the same free trade zone that you are in. Importing lenses from other countries can be painful and expensive, especially with the higher priced goods. Different countries will have different import rules and taxes. Unfortunately, the lens you are looking for might not be available in your trade zone. Carriers like DHL or FedEx have a service that can make the import less time consuming, but more expensive. Especially Canon lenses are commonly offered by professional Japanese dealers. Luckily, most of these dealers know what they are doing, but they also know the value of the lens, so don't expect to make a bargain there. If you can, buy locally. That also helps when you are unhappy with your purchase, for example, if you find scratches or fungus that wasn't mentioned in the product description. eBay also gives you a good overview for what price a lens is traded at the time. If a lens has been up for a while and you want it, it is always a good idea to make a reasonable offer below the asking price first. We often got the lens we wanted considerably cheaper than the listed price. There are reported sales of counterfeit Canon FD SSC aspherical lenses, specifically the 55mm f1.2. The problem is that there is a non-aspherical 55mm f1.2 that looks almost identical on the first look. The only really obvious difference is the nameplate inside the front that marks the lens as a spherical or not. 
The ring can be removed and swapped with the simplest of tools without special experience. All a crook has to do is to reproduce the ring of a 55mm spherical and buy a couple of cheap non-aspherical's. He can then resell for a massive price bump. There are ways to easily tell the difference when you have both versions next to each other. The spherical is slightly longer with a wider space above the focus ring. But when do you have both next to each other? especially with an online offer. Here's a little trick. Ask the seller to send you a photo of the side of the lens, like here, but turned until the 0.6 meter mark is barely visible on the right side. If you can now see the feet in meter markings on the left side, it is indeed an aspherical. If you don't see markings, this is a non-aspherical and worth a fraction. It is time to say thank you to everybody that made this episode possible. We would like to thank all the partners that collaborated with us. Please give them your love. Film Convert for sponsoring this episode and their awesome film emulation Nitrate. Simit for modding our lenses. Benjamin Dowie for giving us his input from a filmmaker's point of view. And PNS Technic for giving us some insights on K35 lenses. You can find links to their products and services in the description. Thank you to Christopher for playing the fallen man. Always a pleasure shooting with you. I would also like to give my warmest thank you to Patrick West Newman for shooting the Canon SC and Canon FDL to match our setup, and Dan Etzer for the photos of the chrome noses. Your contributions are essential to our work. Most of all, I want to say thank you to all our members. Our Kubrick members deserve a special shout out. During the final days of this production, the following Kubrick members supported the creation of this episode. Chris Brett Jones, Necron 1050, Enrico El Tedesco, Stephen Caban, Shrebel, The Woman That Doesn't Want to Be Named, H3FF01, Multidivers, Alex B, Gyazi Sutton, Mick Lexington, Maureen Cremeri, Andy Lynn, Tom Hagworth, Julian, Kropada, Sean Wells, Raul Quiris, Goran Stepek Film Production, Felician.cg, Eugenio Triana, Vit Bejik, Ray Brumor, Nolan Putnam, Bat, Orlando Art, Sheldon Schwartz, Jonathan and Canassian, Piero Van Burek, John Griffith, Christopher Kenway, Focus Shift Media, Tao Tao at Philly, Jazzy Lutis, Twitch.tv slash VV, OVN Media, Stephen Beasley. Thank you, Kubrick members. May the odds be forever in your favor. And thank you to our Lynch and Scott Tier members as well. You make it possible. Give us a like if you think that we deserve one. Leave us your thoughts in the comments, visit us on Instagram, in and our Facebook group. And please, consider becoming an active supporter yourself by joining one of our member tiers. The making of Alien Spoof and the action pack with files waiting for Lynch and Kubrick members. This is Nicholas, signing out with no delicious wishes. Shoot something amazing.